The Shrine of Enlightenment. Author's Note I have been to this place. I have walked on the path of enlightenment, and I have turned the key. Two days later I collapsed and nearly died. That journey is the inspiration for the adventure we now set out on. What parts of this story belong to my adventure, and which to Jim's, is for you to decide. Chapter 1 The A380 Airbus was known by the makers as the Flying Palace. That is what this particular plane actually was, a palace that flew. It belonged to Max Davis, quite possibly the richest man the world had ever known. As anointed hedge fund to the U.S. government, he was the genius that ensured the dollar remained the world's reserve currency. His manipulation of trillions of U.S. debt and the oceans of money contained in the quantitative easing resulted in an infinitesimal percentage rake for him. This tiny slice of the whirlwind of money that circled the globe made him wealthy beyond calculation. However, Jim Evans could work this imponderable amount out using a law most people called 80-20. Put forward by Pareto, an Italian economist, it meant that 20% of people owned 80% of everything. If you applied that rule again a few times, so that 20% of 20% owned 80% of 80% and so on, it means the famously feared 1% of people owned 50% of the whole cake. Then, there was the 1% of the 1% and the 1% of those people. Each time you drilled in, the wealth of this smaller and smaller group of people gets higher and higher. It meant that one person in the world would own about 3% of the total value of the globe. That person, it turned out, was likely to be Max Davis. He would claim it was really the king of Saudi Arabia, but Jim was not so sure. Oil came out of the ground at a reasonable cost, but money moved at almost no charge, and Max Davis pumped and refined it. As all the money in the world is $60 trillion, Jim calculated that Max was worth roughly $2 trillion. This would be 20 million tons of $100 bills, but happily for them both, wealth is not the same as cash. 50,000 tons of gold would cover $2 trillion, about a third of all the gold there ever was. That much gold would fit in the A380. But the plane couldn't fly with that weight on board, and the wheels would probably buckle. These were the thoughts Jim found himself thinking as he walked around the empty flying palace. Davis was sending him to Tokyo as some kind of message to the Bank of Japan. Jim was an embodiment of a statement between the U.S. and Japan saying something like, If you won't do it, then I will. What exactly the it was, he had no idea. Davis was sending Jim because he was the only person in the world who had a more potent trading reputation than the 60 times trillionaire. Jim didn't want to be a trillionaire. He almost didn't want the billions he had. He had earned them playing the markets like a child plays with toy cars or Mozart the clavichord. His wealth was an almost accidental outcome of his ability to read the markets like most can read road signs. This talent had sparked a series of unfortunate events, and his reputation amongst the 1% of the 1% of the 1% had spiraled out of control. Davis was old and now frail, and wanted Jim to replace him, but Jim wouldn't agree. Yet when Davis asked, Jim would do the old man's bidding, so long as it didn't entail him drawing charts of the future of world markets. Davis often reminded Jim that someone had once said, to whom much is given, much will be required, implying that Jim owed the world his vision of the world's economic future. Jim had reminded Davis that the person who said that had been crucified. Jim still went along with Davis' requests because he knew, or at least felt, that much of the time, on balance, Davis worked for the best. Chapter 2 the trouble with Tokyo is that at 5 p.m. it is 9 a.m. in London, so late afternoon to a Brit like Jim Evans feels like a dawn when the early morning hours have been spent either working hard or partying. According to Jim's circadian rhythm, he had been up all night trading, 
and the part of his brain that had developed when his distant ancestors were fish was demanding sleep. The overwhelming desire to sleep is best fought off by drinking Japanese health drinks, potent cocktails of all things simulating with herbs, spices, and vitamins added for good measure. Caffeine equivalent to ten cups of coffee, mixed with ginseng, two grams of vitamin C, and a host of ingredients you wouldn't want translated, potted into a tiny tin can, can cost twenty dollars at the Konbini convenience store. The concoction will get any organism with a pulse past the overwhelming urge to sleep. During late afternoon in Tokyo, visitors are in serious need of such an elixir. However, sleep troubles have only just begun. By midnight, even though the liver has probably flushed all stimulants out of your system, the European time clock hits the wake-up button, and with little trouble, a jet lag sufferer gets their second wind and can power through the Tokyo night on their natural hometown daytime wakefulness till the rise of the rising sun the next morning. Knowing this, Jim had arranged the A380 to touch down in Hamada late evening. He planned to hit the hotel late, attempt to sleep, albeit thirty floors up on a terra firma prone to earth tremors, then have breakfast with his friend Professor Akira Nakabashi. Jim's breakfast came in a double-decker lacquer box, each layer broken into numerous compartments. Inside each little section was penned a strange but delicious-looking snack that he picked out carefully and ate with relish. It was certainly a different breakfast experience from cereal and milk. A Japanese breakfast, at least at this luxury level, was a mix of fish parts, numerous pickled and sauced vegetables, shellfish soup, a glass of bright green juice, brown nutty tea, and a bowl of warm rice porridge. His time clock told him he was eating a late dinner. It was 7.30 a.m. in Tokyo and 11.30 p.m. in London, and the selection, apart from the rice porridge, could certainly pass for a dinner. "'You're looking well,' said Jim to the professor, in an attempt to make his friend enter into a conversation. Akira opened his left hand which attached directly to his shoulder without the arm in between. It was a deformity that, particularly the old Japanese, found disturbing. He held his palm out in agreement. How could I be otherwise? I am studying the jewel that is the Yasakani no Magatama. I am examining it under great magnification. I am absorbing all its most tiny details and all its benign sacred energies. Jim had worn the imperial crown, or at least worn the necklace that was thought to be a crown until it was rediscovered by divers in a sunken gold box taken from the sea. It had been smuggled to London, and Jim had come by it, and much, but not much good, had come of that. Jim scratched his head along the line of the long scar on his scalp. He picked out a piece of soft fish roe from its little compartment. It was cut in such a way that when it was cooked, it was transformed into a star-shaped snack. He waved it in the air. What's this? He asked before popping it in his mouth. It tasted slightly bitter, just like the codro his nan used to make him on toast for Saturday morning breakfast. Professor Nakabashi was apparently struggling momentarily with his excellent English. Fish sperm, he said finally. Swallow or spit, buy or sell. It was the same kind of decision to Jim. He looked perplexed for a second as he swallowed. He had been lied to and deceived his whole life by his nan, the only family he ever had. It wasn't on purpose. It was the whole stupid system around him that had twisted the truth to make it more palatable. Soft cod row wasn't eggs at all. He had always wondered why soft row weren't like hard row, which were a collection of tiny little egg-like spheres. However, the little buzz of wondering had never ended in revelation. Now he knew. They were soft because they were sacks of sperm. I meant what fish, said Jim. I don't know, replied the professor. I can find out for you, Jim. It was hard for him not to tag San at the end of Jim's name. The difficulty twitched across his face as he forced himself to forgo the politeness. Jim didn't like being called Jim-san. I've found out enough. 
Thanks, Akira, said Jim. He imagined a shelf of soft cod row tins in a British supermarket. The labels were all neatly lined up, reading cod sperm. As he was imagining the reaction of shoppers in those milliseconds it takes for a mind to wander across unexplored territory, the professor spoke. After your meeting, would you let me take you to see the fabulous shrine of Zenkoji? Jim blinked and ran the question back through his consciousness. Sure, Akira. We can get a Shinkansen to Nagano. It doesn't take long. Jim was tempted to grab his black phone and surf for details, but he stopped his hand from jumping across the table and instead asked, So it must be a special place, that of all the places in Tokyo you could show me, you want to take me there? Kind of, said Akira, smiling gently. Come on, you're the Imperial Curator. You have access to everything. I'd like you to see it. I'd like your opinion. My opinion? It's not a stock market, is it? There is a lucky bronze cow there, rather like the one on Wall Street, but older. I want you to see it. You are taking me to Nagano to show me a lucky bronze cow. It may be brass. Yes, that's the word. Brass. Jim smiled and would have laughed were he not wondering what Akira was up to. Chapter 3 The Japanese can't have a one-to-one -one meeting without bringing a dozen people along. Jim had had a taste of this in the past. It seemed odd to him. Back in London, a meeting in the bank he used to work with was always pared down to the smallest number of people possible. He was ushered into the Bank of Japan boardroom and politely shown to a place set for him, laid out with a blotter, note paper, a black lacquered ballpoint pen, and a small leather portfolio with the BOJ logo embossed on it, containing a series of glossy printed reports. A posse of nearly old men entered and Jim was swept up in a procession of smiling, bowing, card-exchanging bank bureaucrats. The bankers all looked slightly startled. He put their cards in his top pocket next to his heart. Placing their cards in his trouser pocket next to his backside was said to be construed as an insult. They all sat down, and he took the cards from his pocket and laid them down neatly in three columns. There was no way to match any with the people in front of him. But it was a Japanified thing to do, and it made the small squares of paper with his questions scrawled on them a little less obvious. The questions were from Davos. Some of his notes were also answers. The questions were messages rather than queries to be answered. So, how is your economy faring? meant, your economy is screwed. You need to fix that. Have you considered more QE? meant, do more QE. Can you help me understand the falling yen? was saying, the yen is falling too much. Or at least that was what he thought Davos was getting at. It was the job of politicians and bureaucrats to talk in riddles. It was the next best thing to lying. His answers were general purpose. He could just about decipher his handwriting. Writing with a pen was a skill he used about as often as his fishing rods. It seemed he had written in tiny black scrawl, that is a very interesting question, and I have asked it myself. That's difficult to know. There are many economists working on that problem. The outcome is indeterminate at this stage. He prepared to shuffle the form of these answers if there were many questions following his. The next read, I'm not familiar with that subject. I will try and find out for you. He had to say something if he was asked, but whatever he said had to mean nothing. He was starting to feel uncomfortable. This was definitely not his scene. That bloody Max Davis had put him on the spot yet again. His nan would say, They can't chop your head off. But this was Japan, and there always seemed a possibility they could and might. The scar on the top of his head began to itch. The chairman spoke, I must apologize for such an early time for our meeting. That meant, Screw you, don't think you are important. I must apologize for my English. That probably meant, I don't have to listen or admit to understanding what you say. The chairman told a joke about his student days in California and how his poor English got him in trouble when his car broke down. 
Jim thought this probably meant, I understand those stupid Americans. So, the chairman continued, I understand you have some questions we can help you with. Yes, said Jim, referring to his paperwork. How's it going with the economy? It is very difficult, said the chairman. It has been very difficult for a generation. It has been so very difficult since the bubble years that ended in 1989. But let me ask you, Evansan, you are reputed to see the future of markets. I am told you are like the Italian Nostradamus. He smiled, which meant, see how much English I know, and how much about you I know? You can find treasures, save cities, divine minerals in the ground, perhaps leap tall buildings. He smiled kindly, his eyes glinting behind glasses. Perhaps you... He paused after making a long meal of pronouncing the word you could tell us what will happen to Japan and its economy. Was the chairman suggesting sex and travel to Jim, or was he really asking? Jim looked at his notes. That's indeterminate, he said, then sat up straight and took a deep breath. Except that Japan's population will fall by 50% this century. The wealth of the old will flow to the young, Death taxes will pay off Japan's massive debts, which are held mainly by your old people. Technology and this flow of capital to young people will empower them and create a huge economic boom. With twice as much space for each and every Japanese, the country and its environment will do amazingly. The Japanese seem to have turned to stone. Jim looked around the room. I hope that's okay with you. Chapter 4 Tokyo Station, please, Akira said as the taxi door closed. How did your meeting go? he asked Jim. Jim's black phone rumbled in his pocket. I don't know. I did what I was asked to do, and I told the BOJ what they wanted to know. So you're an economist now, said the encrypted message from Max Davis. There was a smiley on the end of the message. YIYP Jim texted in reply. Davos would have to message back asking for clarification. It meant, your idea, your problem. The Shinkansen bullet train impressed Jim. Japan was the first to build high-speed train lines, and Japan was still the country everyone had to beat for train prestige. There was no bucking and shaking like the European TGV and Eurostar trains. The bullet train didn't seem to move at all, as it headed for Nagano at 200 miles per hour. I'm so looking forward to seeing Zenkoji again, said Akira. It is a Buddhist shrine of pilgrimage, one of the few left, and it was built before Buddhism reached Japan in the 600s. Jim smiled and nodded. He liked old things, but relics outside of his basic European context meant much less to him than a rusty bit of old Roman iron. A piece of an everyday medieval brooch found on the foreshore meant more to him than the exquisite royal robes of some Asian ruler. One medieval English farthing resonated more to him than a whole pot of verdigris-encrusted Chinese cash coins. You're into what you are into, he would tell dealers and eager representatives from the world's auction houses. I'm not keen on paintings. I don't like guns and you can keep your carved ivory. Poor bloody elephants. Islamic fretwork, no thanks. Chinese jade, carved Eskimo whale bones, African fetishes, not for me. What would I do with a 40-foot totem pole, apart from the obvious? Inca gold was interesting, but a nope. Egyptian mummies, giant newly discovered diamonds, Micronesia war canoes. They just weren't his thing. Yet, a bit of bent old metal, fresh out of the ground from a plowed field in England, or off the London River foreshore, and he was all over it like ivy up an oak tree. He had even been one shaky signature away from buying a City of London office building project so he could excavate the ground below the demolished site for relics. But he had stopped short, aware that doing that would just build on his unwelcome reputation for being a mysterious and perhaps sinister super-rich young gazillionaire. Getting very rich was like becoming an adult, 
There was no easy way back to the world he came from. The shrine Zenkoji has a statue, said Akira. I used to be called Kenko, said Jim, because I used to bring everyone on the bank's trading floor coffee. The professor squinted in misapprehension. Zenko, not Kenko, he said helpfully. Kenko is a coffee brand, said Jim, by way of explanation. Akira smiled. Zen Koji, he emphasized. It has a statue of the Buddha that came to Japan from India, across Asia through Korea. It was the first image of Buddha to reach our islands. It is a sacred and precious object, one kept hidden, and only an ancient copy is shown once every seven years. Really? said Jim. Typical. Why try and make something secret and scarce when it's already ancient, sacred, and priceless? That doesn't make sense to me. No one can see the original, not even the priests. Not that old one again. Yes, no, said the professor. No, yes. So actually it has long since been destroyed. No, no, said Akira. It is there, but it is the sacred secret of the shrine. Okay? But we aren't going to see it today, then. No. No one sees the statue. It has been like that since before history. That's fine. I have no terrible desire to see anything in particular. I'm cool with just doing some sightseeing. People come from all over Japan on pilgrimage to see the copy when it's shown. Okay. Why not? The copy is very, very old. It is also sacred and priceless. So if no one is allowed to see the statue, how is a copy made? Akira looked thoughtful. There are many ancient mysteries at Zenkoji. And what about the other hidden treasures? Said Jim, trying to tease the professor. Akira fixed him with a stare. Vast, he said, giving Jim a look that seemed to say, how do you know? Don't wind me up, said Jim, grinning. Akira was still staring at him inquisitively, so he grabbed a bag full of food bought at the station and pulled out a box of tasty-looking sushi. He offered it to Akira. I'd prefer the unagi, came the reply. Jim passed him the bag which contained, amongst other packaged dishes, a box of rice and cooked eel covered with soy paste. You can get from London to Paris in the time it takes to get to Nagano, said Jim, after his first piece of tuna and rice. He looked down at the ikura, salmon eggs on rice encircled with a sheet of dry seaweed paper called nori. Now that's what I call fish eggs, he thought. His nan had liked to say, Sure as eggs is eggs, when something was obvious. Now that turned out not necessarily to be the case, and it had taken him twenty-five years to find out. After all, maybe if he looked up to the heavens at where the planets should be with a telescope, they wouldn't be there. If eggs weren't eggs, then perhaps Jupiter didn't sit there in its orbit, and with a thousand-year-old storm cloud angrily rotating. If they could lie to a child about fish eggs, why not lie about planets? When I get back to England, he said to Akira, I'm going to buy a bloody great telescope and look at the planets. Some people look outwards for enlightenment. Some people look inwards, said Akira. I didn't know you were religious, Akira. I'm not, he replied. The enlightenment I seek is purely autistic. I will try and not bore you by examining features at the shrine for too long. He rustled in a bag and pulled out a small camera with an outsized lens. If I find something too fascinating, I will take a photograph. Akira smiled broadly. The temple has been damaged many times by fire, but much of it is from a timeless period. I admit I am excited. Chapter 5 They got out of the cab at the end of an arcade of streets that led up to the shrine. The rows of shops had a festive feeling to them. There was no Christian-style suffering to be seen. Each small establishment exuded the quaint novelty of a fun fair ride or a market stall. There was a pervasive smell of cooking wafting down towards them, which was either sweet or savory, 
or both. Jim tried to work out what each shop was offering as they walked up the incline towards the temple compound. From one, a white ice cream was for sale, and Jim reckoned it was unlikely to be vanilla. There were a lot of lucky charms for sale. He bent down and picked up a yellow one which caught his eye. It was a tiny embroidered yellow sack on a silk rope which you could attach it to a keychain or a mobile phone. It will help you have a happy and healthy pregnancy, commented Akira, as Jim offered a 500 yen coin to the shop owner. That will be incredibly lucky, said Jim. I'll be a global headline for weeks. Actually, it is for good fortune in studying for exams, said the professor, smiling. Maybe all the answers are in the bag, said Jim, before thanking the store owner by giving him a little bow and a smile. Domo. Domo. Possibly, said Akira, though the writing would need to be very small. Jim stuck the charm in his jacket pocket. He was tempted to buy some charcoal barbecued rice on a stick, but Akira was clearly intent in getting to the shrine. It was uphill all the way, which was kind of how Jim thought of religion in general. The way of the righteous was set on a steep upward incline, it seemed and paved with uneven cobbles. The gatehouse of the shrine contained two huge wooden carvings of giants. Jim admired them. How does anyone carve that? He wondered out loud. The wooden giants stood in their own rooms on either side of the road that led up to the shrine compound. If it wasn't clear that the sculptures were made out of large pine trees, they would indeed be very imposing. But however Jim looked at them, they were clearly made of wood and carved by people. Was there ever a time when people would be frightened by this stuff? He asked. Akira thought for a moment. Japan is an animist society. We believe things have souls. We are made of meat. These demons are made of wood. Being still does not mean you cannot move. It is the soul that moves the body. Why cannot the soul of these demons move these bodies of wood? Seems like a long shot, said Jim. But these demons certainly look like trouble. They walked through the gateway, the first whiffs of incense drifting towards them from great brass cauldrons where pilgrims burnt their prayers to send them to the heavens as appealing perfume. Come this way, said Akira. Let me show you the lucky bull. Jim followed Akira into a low building on the side of the temple compound. In it lay a golden brass bull, perhaps a third of the size of a real bull. If you touch it, you will be lucky, said Akira. They say that about the Wall Street bull, said Jim. In fact, its testicles have been shined up by all the hopeful traders looking for similar trading balls. In this case, it's the horns that are lucky. I can see that said Jim, admiring the polishing work of thousands of hopeful hands. He grabbed the bull's horns with both hands. You can't have too much luck. Akira took his turn, gripping a horn with his short left hand. The wrist was part of his shoulder, and he pulled away from the bull as if somehow his arm would magically be pulled out of his torso as a result. I now have all the luck I need, he said taking a bow to the bronze bull. He bowed again in silence. Let us go inside the shrine. The wind had picked up a little, and clouds of incense spun their way towards them as they crossed the open cobbled area to the temple steps. The building was square and high, sat on a pedestal of stone the size of an office block. It was made of wood, and on its top, sixty feet up, was a roof like a giant hat, perched above a lower roof, which sat like an undergarment for the great pyramid of tiles that crowned the structure. Unattended burning incense and massive blocks of dry wood, Jim said as they went up the stairs. That's not a great mix. It would worry me if I worked here. Fire has been the undoing of many shrines, said Akira, and this temple has burnt many times. Jim trotted up the steps with Akira, coming up slowly behind. 
Jim realized the professor was showing reverence to the sacred structure, so stopped and then stepped carefully up the last few stairs. Inside the shrine itself, there was a large tatami-matted area for services, and at the front, a long altar, backed with a complex altarpiece decked out with objects. It was all meaningless to Jim. Without sacred context, divine relics and sacrosanct objects were just so much metal and wood. While some people would be impressed by the sanctity of a religious place and others the artistry and craftsmanship of its architecture, what impressed Jim about the shrine was the sheer work that had gone into creating it. People had labored over every tiny centimeter of the shrine. Untold lives had been poured into its expression of devotion. Men had gone into the hills in search of the tallest, proudest cypress trees, found and felled them, then dragged the dead-weight carcass by brute force over untamed and unmade ground mile after mile to the site. They had dug foundations and quarried rock with their bare hands and rudely worked tools, and that was just the start of the effort that had built the fantastic structure that was the Zenkoji Shrine. Since Homo sapiens had climbed down from the trees and walked out of Africa, they had been hacking nature into structures that pointed at the sky to try and troll the gods into sending presents. Seeking divine support went back to the very beginning of the ascent of the weak but smart African apes. Humans were convinced that something bigger than them could be convinced to stoop down and cut them a break. Even as they grew super smart and logical, they would continue to beg supernatural forces for a special deal, even if it meant groping the bronze testicles of the golden calf of Wall Street. Over there is something truly fascinating, said Akira, pointing. There is an underground passage that leads under the altar, and in it is the key to enlightenment and paradise. Really? said Jim. But I suppose it is secret, and no one is allowed into it, and it's been closed for a thousand years. Akira gave him a puzzled look. No, he said. It costs five hundred yen to go in. But there is no key to find, continued Jim, because it's a heavenly mystery only the Chosen can find. Akira blinked. No, I think the key hangs from the wall. I don't know, I've never gone through it. You see, the passage is a metaphor for a life. You travel through life in the darkness of ignorance, looking for the key of enlightenment, which will release you to a life in paradise. Oh, I get it, said Jim. Sounds like fun. Shall we try it? Why not? Jim smiled. I could use a shot at redemption. It is over there said Akira, pointing down the right-hand side of the shrine. Jim smiled when he paid the 500 yen. It seemed only fair to be charged to have a crack at enlightenment. The equivalent of five dollars to have a chance for a ticket to paradise was a great deal, at least in theory. They took their shoes off and left them with others and headed for the entrance to the tunnel. The tunnel would take them below the altar, and the space in front of it looked as if it was the place where the priests did their thing. The entrance was basically a hatch, with a very steep set of stairs to the corridor below. This is the entrance to a life, said Akira. Ah, said Jim. As we are going through it at roughly the same time, that would make us twins. Do you think we might be strange brothers? asked Akira. Brothers from a different mother, to be sure, said Jim. He stepped down. Wow, it really is pitch black down here. Akira stood in the light of the entrance. It is the darkness of our ignorance. We are all groping blindly for the truth. Jim looked into the back. He could take out his mobile phone and light the place up, but that would somehow defeat the object of the exercise. Yet his inner teenager was not quite dead, and he patted his phone in his pocket to secure its whereabouts. If the path ahead got tricky... He was going to go practical on the problem. This is like a haunted house ride, said Jim, running his hand up and down both sides of the narrow passage walls in search of something that might be a key. Yes, said Akira, somewhere behind. 
Having almost immediately turned a corner, it was now completely dark. He could not see his hands as he held them up in front of his face. His eyes would not adjust to the total darkness. There was simply no light in the tunnel for them to latch onto. He moved along slowly, trying to find something on the wall. A hole, perhaps, or a protuberance, or even a chain with something on the end. What would the key be? Was it a key, or was the key itself a metaphor? Was there even a key at all? If there was no key, it would always be there to challenge the next searcher. That's weird, he said. There are vents in the floor and I can feel a draft coming up through them. I'm sure the shrine goes down many levels, said Akira from somewhere behind. I guess it would, said Jim. This is quite a long life we are living, he added, starting to get bored of shuffling along in the dark. It's funny how being blind makes distances seem so much longer. It feels like we've traveled a long way, but I bet it's only a few feet. I agree, replied the professor. Without wisdom, all journeys are never-ending. Did you just make that up? Said Jim. Yes. Do you like it? It's not bad, Jim said. He felt something on the wall. Bugger me, he said involuntarily. There's a big door knocker thing hanging from the wall here. That will be the key. Well, I found it then. Well done, said Akira. You have earned enlightenment and a passage to paradise. Good, well, come over here and get a ticket to heaven too. Jim lifted the key on its hinge. It was like a big Victorian door handle, and he imagined that like the bull, it was also bronze. It was certainly heavy enough. He sniffed his hand, and it smelt like the metallic moldy smell of a copper alloy. He turned the key back and forth like a door handle. It pulled out a little as he tugged on it, so he pulled and turned it both right and left, as if somehow it would open a door. What are you doing? asked Akira, only inches away from him. No point finding a key if you're not going to turn it. Anything happening? No, nothing. Your turn. Give me your hand. Akira's right hand reached out for him and touched his shoulder. Jim took his hand and put it onto the key. Sugoi, said Akira. That means, wow, right? Roughly. Jim was rather pleased with himself. He had found the key, something he hadn't expected to be in the passage at all. It was big and obvious, at waist height, and anyone would have found it but he still felt a sense of achievement. So what age are we in tunnel time? Asked Jim. Is this halfway through the journey? And are we 30-something? Or is old age just around the bend? It's hard to know, said Akira, dropping the key back against the wall with a clunk. We will only know at the end. Well, let's see if we can live this life of ignorance without falling on our faces. Jim shuffled on the curious draft from below blowing onto his socked toes. With his shoes on, he would have never have noticed the airflow. There was a lot more metaphorical life to live in the totally dark tunnel. Enlightenment must have been reached early, because the tunnel years stretched on and on. Then the passage turned left and right, and Jim guessed it was doing its best to snake around on itself. A thousand years ago, this must have been state-of-the-art entertainment, he said. Are you there, Professor? Yes, I'm here, replied Akira. Ah, he said in relief as he turned a corner. Light and stairs. We will rise to enlightenment, said Akira. Let's go, Ariadne, before we die of metaphors. Chapter 6 Jim was quite happy to see the light again. He was surprised with himself for being affected even in the slightest. What could happen in a tourist attraction where you walk down a short dark passage? So this must be heaven, said Akira, brushing down his trousers as if he had been rolling around in dust. I'll take it, said Jim. They began to walk back towards their shoes. Two gowned priests, flapping like flags in the wind, marched sharply towards them, smiling. Come this way, they said, bowing low. There is a service, said Akira. 
They think we should come and watch. He pointed at the wide space of tatami mats in front of the altar. The priests were bowing and smiling with encouragement. Okay, said Jim. I've never seen a Buddhist service. The monks flapped in front of them, showing them the way into the congregation area, which was empty of worshippers. They sat cross-legged, a few feet from the raised stage where the priests would do their ceremony. Jim's knees didn't like being crossed. It was not a posture his legs had much practice at. A few Japanese drifted in, dressed like all good congregationalists in Sunday best suits. There were now just eight people, including Jim and Akira, sat on the floor in an area big enough for a thousand. A drumming and ringing of bells and a deep chanting started up off stage. The singing gave no clue how many priests there were behind the screens. It was a low growling resonating harmonic that seemed unnatural to Jim's western ear. Three gowned monks appeared with various small instruments, singing and clinking, drumming and droning. No wonder no one comes to the services, Jim thought, as they proceeded across the stage in front of the altarpiece. It looked like a weird surrealist play put on for an obscure arts channel by some avant-garde dance troupe. Jim very soon glazed over at the performance while Akira sat cross-legged in a state of apparent coma. If what they were singing was meaningful, Jim wasn't going to get a translation from the professor. Memories of being a child at a funeral started to nudge into Jim's head. The boredom, the frustration an overwhelming wish to get out into the sun to talk, play, and make noise was welling up in him. The lost child in him was fidgeting. It was going to be an excruciating thirty minutes, or however long Buddhists take to do their thing. Then, with horror, Jim remembered that the Russian Orthodox Church would worship for five to eight hours. He prepared himself for the moment when, come what may, he would get up silently and walk directly to the exit and leave, if princes could do it, then he could do it too. But for half an hour, he would stick out the boredom. A priest in black appeared. Unlike the flappy-gowned monks, he wore something close to a tunic. He walked to the front center of the stage, and two worshippers who sat cross-legged there reeled back. They shuffled to one side, as if there was some high-volted shock risk that would arc from the priest and strike them. Jim took note. He must be a big cheese to create that effect, he mused, because there was nothing but sunny welcome on his face. The black priest spoke for a few minutes and turned his head to look back at the altar and its far left corner. A little door in an alcove slid up and revealed a hidden compartment. There appeared to be a golden object in the nook and two or three other items Jim could not recognize from his distant low vantage point. The door slid down, covering the items, and the priest turned back to the small audience and started to talk again. The little audience looked extremely humbled and bowed in their sitting position, except for Akira. He sat bolt upright, his eyes fixed on the alcove. The priest clapped his hand as if to say, The end! And the flapping monks began to chant, ringing their finger bells and drum. The stage emptied and the Japanese congregation got up. Jim followed. Interesting, said Akira. Yes, said Jim, fixing the location of his shoes and making a beeline for them. They put on their footwear and went out of a side door into the beauty of the shrine gardens lit by a bright sun. It is always good to get out of a church, said Jim. Shall I tell you what just happened, said Akira. You can if you like, said Jim. I'll try hard to pay attention. The man in black is the chief abbot of the shrine. I do not think he is seen much in public. That little door that opened was a secret shrine, one of the seven secret shrines of Zenkoji. Not opened for a thousand years, said Jim sarcastically, and containing the lost artifact of the Buddha. No, it's not that one, it's another, said Akira earnestly. How do you know of that? Jim shrugged. Doesn't everyone? The shrine we saw is very seldom opened, perhaps three or four times a year. We were very lucky to see it. It looked like there was an Oscar award in there and a couple of empty flower vases. I couldn't see, 
said Akira. My eyes are weak. So what are the seven secret shrines of Zenkoji? Oh, now that is a long story, said Akira. A long, boring tale you most certainly won't have patience for. Thanks, Akira. That is very kind of you. But can you give me an executive summary? Akira smiled and waved his left hand at him. Of course, it will be my pleasure. He reached up with his long hand and tapped a branch of Sakura, the flowering cherry tree that the Japanese hold so dear. Blossoms flew up and fluttered to the ground like confetti. Life is short, said Akira, and does not often embody the beauty of the short life of the flowering cherry. Life is lived to gain enlightenment. With enough enlightenment a soul can rise above existence, experience complete happiness, contentment, and be at one with the universe. According to this shrine there are seven enlightenments, each leading to a higher, more advanced existence. With enlightenment a soul sheds its base material, becoming finer and purer, wool becomes silk, silver becomes gold, until after the seventh enlightenment the soul becomes a Buddha, and then nothing. I think I'd miss the last step, said Jim. Being Buddha sounds pretty good, though. The seven secret shrines represent the seven enlightenments that must be achieved to transcend, and we were shown the first, the Haibutsu, the never-seen statue of the Buddha, the secret Buddha, brought from India, carved from the Buddha's own likeness, in his own presence, is reputed to be in the seventh shrine, and to touch it brings the final revelation. Jim was about to say, and you can play this game on the Xbox One. When his mouth fell open, he shook his head and laughed. And there is a vast treasure. Yes, beyond the seventh shrine, it is said, is the treasure of Japan, hidden away from the Mongol invasion that never came. So well hidden, it could never be retrieved. Exactly. How do you know the story? It is most obscure. I'm just working it out as I go along. It's an interesting story, isn't it? And I'm just here by accident to see a lucky brass cow. Actually, Jim, I admit, I thought you would enjoy this beautiful place, and that it would give me an opportunity to get your opinion. My opinion on what? On whatever came to your mind. You mean you want me to help you crack these secret puzzles? Well, if there indeed are any puzzles, wouldn't it be fascinating to explore them? Well, Akira, let me tell you what comes to my mind. You go down the passage of life, turn the key of enlightenment, then something special happens. You have to go back down and have another life, and turn the key again. What then? Haven't you ever played a computer game? No. You've never played a computer game, exclaimed Jim in disbelief. No, my father considered them corrupting. You've never played a computer game? said Jim slowly. Well, you must be the only Japanese. No, you must be the only person in the world never to do that. There are others, I'm sure. Look, said Jim, that's how puzzles work. Key, lock, door. You get the key, you unlock the door, you go into the next room and solve the next puzzle. I understand. So you would go down, find the key, go through the tunnel, watch the show, go back down the tunnel, turn the key, and a door opens. Oh, said Akira, smiling. Do you think that is what would happen? You tell me. You're the guy trying to get me into this little adventure. I won't deny it. So what now? What now? I'll tell you. Nothing happens next. Imagine this. We go back now, back down the tunnel and turn the key. Let's say we are right. Nothing good happens next. Let's say a door opens. Are you going in? If this really is some ancient monk's game to reach paradise, you can bet it's going to be a shortcut to heaven via a quick death. I'm not going through that door. You're not going through that door. Not today, not ever. My days of adventure are over. Akira screwed up his face. His left hand clenched in a fist. He looked like a man trying desperately to overcome a bad case of constipation. You are right, Jim-san, he said finally. And if there is no door that opens, 
we will feel dejected and foolish. The outcome of going back to test the hypothesis is either humiliation or death, or perhaps both. I'm not going to disagree with you, said Jim. Let's just enjoy the idea that it might be there. Let's not play snakes and ladders with some crazy dead monks. So, 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 said Akira, nodding. Chapter 7 The day Abbot marched into the room of observance and Yoshi, the young priest, stood up gracefully from his seated position on the wooden floor. They have left the temple, announced the day Abbot. Yoshi looked up at the seven signals and at the rightmost one which had dropped down on its cord. The signal would fall a few times a year, and this had been the second time he had been on duty when it had happened. He stepped up the two broad steps to the shallow dais over which the signals hung and pulled the rightmost rope. The fallen signal rose, and he felt a jerk on the rope as the system was reset. He turned and clapped. The day abbot swung around on his heels and swept out. Yoshi's shoulders dropped, and he hopped down the steps. He was hurting for a smoke. He sat back down, smoking the shrine. He would have to give up one, but the fear of the world balanced out his need for tobacco. His father was a monk, and his grandfather too. Not being a monk would be like leaving the earth for another planet. His mother had given up the world to be a temple wife. What would she do if he left the temple? and jumped into the harsh world beyond the safe predictability of the shrine. He was hikikomori, with a kind of Japanese claustrophobia that struck teens, making them avoid all social contact. Rather than remain holed up in his bedroom with his mother bringing him udon noodles on a tray, he had locked himself in the shrine. To travel beyond the bounds of the temple and its precincts was an unwelcome adventure. He only did it for necessities like family visits, money, top-ups for his smartphone, or a packet of precious cigarettes. He focused on the signals. There were seven. That only the first dropped, and then only rarely, was a sign of the futility of being. There were seven secrets, seven enlightenments, but for all the untold visitors that came from the world and its modern complexity, only three or four brushed past the first insight. What that first insight was, he didn't know. The first key was hardly hard to discover, and all you had to do was pull and turn it hard enough that the signal would trigger. That no one had, as far as he knew, ever gone further, confirmed that the world was truly in darkness. When he had asked about the second signal, the abbot had shouted at him. Perhaps others had gone further in years gone by. The life of a young Buddhist monk was to learn patience. It would be some hours before he could have a cigarette, and four days before he could get more credits for his smartphone. Chapter 8 Jim and Akira didn't say much on the bullet train back. Jet lag was numbing Jim's consciousness like the blow of a rubber mallet to the back of his head. He fell asleep, his head against the window lulled by the smoothness of the train's flight and the comfort of the chair. Professor Nakabashi sat in quiet contemplation. His plan had worked to an extent. Jim had established what he had already ascertained from his studies. Zenkoji was actually a giant puzzle box, and at its center would be the divine and priceless Haibutsu statue, the legendary hidden Buddha. There would be seven, or perhaps nine, or even eleven puzzles. There might even be thirteen. The key promised to send a soul straight to paradise. This was a joke of a Buddhist nature. It would send a soul to paradise by parting it from the body that acted as its container. Jim was right. If a door opened and you went through it, the chances of leaving the shrine again would be low. When the shrine was built, there was no law a modern man could recognize. A samurai could cut you in half if he felt you looked at him incorrectly. Life was cheap, and even the murderous, entitled samurai were taught that they were an inconsequential cherry blossom, whose life should be thrown away in short moments of glory and splendor. The universal wheel of karma would decide the fate of the adventurer that entered the puzzle of the seven secret shrines, the cosmic justice of a perfectly balanced universe. 
the cunning and strength of the monks that built the labyrinth, would no doubt toy with the adventurer, wishing to find enlightenment, like a cat with a mouse. Akira struggled with imagining what would lie beyond the secret door. The shrine was built before industry and science. Its puzzles, traps, and punishments would have to operate using simple principles. They would have to be made from earth, air, fire, and water, for the designers had nothing else to work with. They had no machines, no power as we would understand it. They only had basic tools and objects. There would be pitfalls for sure. He imagined booby traps, but then wondered how, once set, they could survive for long. Years would rot and rust, unfurl and decay. A hundred years would turn a vicious trap to dust, a poisonous creature to bleached bones. Perhaps there was no secret. How much easier would it be to create a legendary puzzle with no solution? A handle that turned but unlocked no door would be unsolvable forever. Unlike the physical works of man, legends never fell into ruin. Instead, they rose ever higher. Perhaps the lesson of the shrine was there was no way to reach enlightenment, no path to paradise. Perhaps the wisdom of the monks was to show that the only way to escape the pain and suffering of a burning ambition to find the answer to life was to give up caring about it. Perhaps the road to paradise was to follow Jim and walk away. He took a gold coin from his pocket and studied the black ink lettering on it, written by a scribe to denote its value and validity. Gold and ink, they were all that was valuable, then and now. Taking it in his short left hand, he leant forward and slipped it into Jim's jacket pocket. Some people threw coins into wells, some into springs and rivers. The Japanese threw them into wooden temple boxes. Everyone had a reason to summon up a wish, and each offering had a special receptacle. Akira was merely modifying the form of that universal votive spell. Chapter 9 Jim reached into his pocket for the hotel suite key. It wasn't there, but he found something odd instead. He pulled it out. It was a gold lozenge, an ancient gold Koban coin from the Edo period. He located the door key, swiped it over the electronic lock, and pushed into his rooms. He pulled out his mobile and called Akira. Hey there, he said. I have three years of rice in my pocket. I don't know how it got there. Thank goodness, said Akira. I thought I had lost it. Can I come around tomorrow morning to get it? How did you lose it in my pocket? I'm impressed you know the Koban is worth three years of rice supply. I'm out of here at 10.30. Shall I be there at 9? That's fine. He knew he'd be awake at 3 in the morning in any event. He flipped the coin in his hand. It was about $500 in gold. That meant a man's existence was bought for less than a dollar a day in medieval Japan, and it seemed likely that a man himself would be valued at little more. Even his calculating mind could not grasp just how cheap that made life in those days. It was less than a sprig of cherry blossom at the hotel florist. 